This unit is, I think, the most exciting of the 22 in the series. It's, for you, very much a relaxation from the slog of learning mineral names and learning how to classify igneous rocks and learning new geological jargon. It's a unit that deals with the big idea of geology, the unifying theory that represents to geology what evolution represents to biology. It's the theory of plate tectonics, the realization that the surface shell of the Earth is composed of a mosaic of plates, rather like the back of a tortoise shell. The big ideas of any branch of science are much more interesting and exciting to read about and to think about than the gathering of data. For example, if you're a biology student, then learning and reading about evolution is much more exciting than learning to gather the basic data of biology, classifying plants and animals. And for this reason, I'm quite sure that you will find this unit on plate tectonics much more exciting and stimulating to your curiosity than learning to classify igneous rocks. The advent of plate tectonics enabled us to explain many geological phenomena that you're familiar with that previously were not very well explained. Earthquakes and volcanoes are two very obvious examples. If ever there was a eureka moment in geology, it would be the moment when the first geologists recognized the boundaries of those plates and suddenly a great many things fell into place, a many, many geological phenomena. So the first half hour of this hour is devoted to the Planet of Man program, the Jigsaw Fit, and then half an hour of more plate tectonics. previously had a total misconception about the Earth. The original idea of continental drift involved the continents moving around like ships uh, in the oceans, through the oceans. But the new idea is that the surface of the Earth is divided into a series of plates, which are bigger than continents. Which we call this motion uh, of these plates, plate tectonics. And there are about, only about six of these major plates. And they each comprise ocean and land as well. And uh, the motion of these plates relative to one another is where mountains are built or where mid-ocean ridges form by the separation of these plates or where plates slide past one another as in the St. Andrews Fault in California. Realms of eternal mystery so they seem to early man living in the long shadows of mountains. Here, where the land reached up into the heavens beyond the clouds, he could stand in the presence of his gods and ghosts, his demigods and demons. Here he could feel them gazing down upon him in silence from their icy thrones, or listen to them whispering their secrets to one another in the alien tongues of mountain winds. In terror, he heard them at war, the land quaking with their anger, and rivers of fire boiling up from the depths of the earth to spew from gaping mouths of long, silent volcanoes. Later generations of men, less pious, came to cross the mountains in search of wealth and the promise of a new life beyond. To them, they were barriers, everlasting obstacles that stood firmly between a dream and its fulfillment places less of mystery than of trial, adversity, and misery. And when finally man conquered the mountains and probed them with his sciences, he found nested in their secret places not gods, not demons, but the elements of a new mystery. Here, on the peaks of even the highest, five miles above the face of the land, he unearthed rocks that had once been formed beneath the seas and learned that mountains too have a beginning.
And more, he learned that the earthquakes and volcanism that from time to time shook the world around him were the sound not of gods at war, but of the earth itself being shaped. At first consideration, there seems little pattern to the distribution of mountains. They stand on most of the major continents of the world. The Andes of South America. The multiple ranges of Western North America. The mountains of the Western Pacific and Indonesia. And the great Himalayan Alpine belt stretching from China to Western Europe. When viewed from above, however, they are arranged in long, narrow belts running thousands of miles, suggesting that they are not random creations. In the past, many had observed that volcanic and earthquake activity was characteristic of mountainous regions. But the first observations were imprecise and of little value. However, in the early 1950s, the refinement of the seismograph made exact observation possible. For with this instrument, sensitive to the most minor disturbances in the Earth, scientists were able accurately to locate the sources of earthquakes. These disturbances were traced to long, narrow belts. They coincided exactly with the continental mountain ranges and mountainous island arcs. More remarkable was the discovery that these narrow belts of earthquake activity ran off the continental margins and through the ocean basins ultimately connecting the continental belts and dividing the world with continuous lines of earthquake activity. They also discovered that most of the active volcanoes are found along these earthquake belts. If, as the investigation had revealed, there was a direct relationship between the continental mountain ranges and the belts of earthquake and volcanic activity, scientists had then to fathom if a similar relationship applied to the belts that wound through the ocean basin. And fathom was precisely what was done. For with the development of sonar instruments, it was now possible to map the ocean floor. They discovered a system of huge ridges as large as the continental mountain ranges. and a series of very deep trenches. When the information was compiled, the discovery was made. The belts of earthquake and volcanic activity did indeed follow the mid-oceanic ridges and trenches. In the early 60s, a remarkable discovery here on the mid-Atlantic ridge provided an explanation for the undersea tremors and volcanism. The sea floor was actually fracturing and spreading. Further investigation brought